It's great to have you here in Zurich. Uh, it's been an amazing two days so far. Yes, it has. What are your impressions so far from, from the convention and the city itself? Uh, the, the people are so warm and, and lovely. And the, my favorite, the favorite thing that I've gone through is experiencing the warmth of the fans and kind of being able to connect a little bit with everyone and find out what uh, the story means to them and uh, being able to kind of have that one-on-one -on -one connection is really cool and something that, that you don't always get when you work on a project. So that's probably the number one uh, thing, my favorite thing about the uh, impression about this. Do, do fans also bring gifts to you when they meet you? Uh, not yet. Uh, Every once in a maybe a business card or something like that. <laughs> so what is the craziest uh, present they are brought to, to me? Um, uh, just a little drawing, actually. It's a, a handmade thing, which is a very personal, personal gift, which is nice. So this is the first time you are in Zurich, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Or in Switzerland at all. So I ask myself, if you got invited to a convention like this, uh, you do your research about the country you're going, how do you prepare for a trip like that? <laughs> I watch YouTube. <laughs> I started off actually looking at different things like where to go in Zurich um, or in Switzerland and uh, start just doing some research online about that and uh, also I have some relatives in Italy so like talking to them perhaps about places to go as well. And, and all the places have been so far, they were good like they Oh, absolutely. YouTube? Absolutely. Well, mostly I've been to like some of the mo uh, amazing restaurants and just with incredible views of the Lima River or um, and just incredible food. And so, had, uh, like last night, having the Spatzi or something, where it's being able to, and probably my favorite are the roast meat, uh, the, the little potato cakes, which are, are phenomenal. So, I'm enjoying stuff like that. So, it's going to be a sad day for you when you have to come back. Yes, it is. And actually, so we're, I'm going to like stay a couple days extra. And just uh, you know, explore some of the area. Um, maybe go down to Lugano um, as well and check out some of that area. So you're not only known for being an actor in a computer game, you also do TVs and movies and voice acting and all that kind yes, of stuff. Yes, indeed. I'm so you're, you're doing this for quite a while. How did you end up being in the, the gaming industry? How did that work? Um, I, it was through my theatrical agent, uh, who sends me on for like TV and film and. They just sent me in an audition for L.A. Mar, which was the first one way back in the day from Rockstar. And they they needed um, some really good performances, so they were looking for actors who, uh, because they wanted in the game to be able to tell whether the character was lying or telling the truth, or maybe you couldn't quite tell because your action of, of whether they knew it um, Try and cajole them into giving you information or beating them up into giving you information would kind of depend on that performance. And so it started with that and motion capture for that, which then led to other games as well. So that was my start. Are there any differences between castings for, for motion capture um, gaming, for instance, or for, for a movie? You know, it, it, basically it's the same. Basically it's the same. In terms of what I do, it's how I prepare. Um, Maybe it's a bit more more preparation for motion capture because you have to be ready to kind of improvise on it and take it in a totally different direction. Whereas it seems more with like TV or film, it's it's very straightforward and uh, they don't have as much time to kind of play with it. Whereas fortunately, uh, motion capture is a bit more of a, a collaborative effort, and um, they, it seems like in video games they're a bit more open. To the suggestion and like, hey, let's try it this way, um, and so you can actually do that even in the audition process, which is nice. Uh, if you can say, hey, okay, we did that color, let's try it in the character's a little rougher or something like that, and it can change the whole scene. I suppose you need some extra skills as well doing motion capture. It's not only your personal face that is in front of the camera. It's like every move you do with your face and everything is getting transported into. Digital character. That, that's exactly right. Um, but the, the weirdest thing you have to do is like not think about it. I, I say you, you have to use your imagination and pretend that um, things that aren't there are. Meaning you're in this white room and they fill in the entire set with computer 
years after you've done it, but when you're shooting it, it's actually uh, empty. The space is empty. Maybe there might be like two boxes that you're sitting on that then they make it look like these chairs or something like that. So you have to make what's not there pretend to be there. But then you're also wearing these helmets and these cameras that are right in your face every time you talk and move and the other person is dressed the same way. And you have to pretend that that stuff that's there is not there. So it's this weird trick of using your imagination to get rid of some things and yet pretend other things are there that actually I really like and makes it a lot of fun. So that's uh, one of the best things about doing motion capture. It, it is crazy. That, that's the, and the word is crazy, well said. How do you prepare for something like that? I mean, if, if I'm in a room where there is nothing, and I would have yeah. to imagine, imagine that I have to lift up something that is not even there, or to, I don't know, even ride a bike, but right. do it in the days on. Well, how do you prepare for that? At, at, uh, for me, um, doing research, first of all, using your imagination. And um, I'm not a, a motorcycle rider, so I had to do some research on how to ride a motorcycle. And uh, for me, that was actually like watching again some things on YouTube and seeing like how uh, some of these bikes are so heavy that you can't just, you can't just pick them up from the front. You have to kind of get in front and then Move, use your whole body like that to, to pick them up. And so then when we were shooting with these bikes, they're bikes that are made out of just plastic pipe that don't look anything like a motorcycle. Um, I knew when it came time that we had to, like one of the scenes in, um, uh, at the beginning of, of Days Gone, we had to lift up these bike, and I knew that we had to do it that way rather than just kind of grab it because the bike would actually in real life be too strong or too heavy. How does that work with the motion? If you sit on a virtual bike and it actually moving, is it moving when you shoot? No, no, it's not at all. So like you'll you'll get on a bike and you have to pretend like you're you know, doing the kick and then sitting down and you just in it you you pantomime that whole um, motion, which I don't for me it helps you actually get into the scene, so I really like that. So from all the stuff you did so far, voice acting and, and Pure games and so what's the most fun for you to do? And, and motion capture, uh, by far. Um, for me, the reason is like when you do, I was just doing a, a TV project and it's so slow. Um, you rehearse a scene and then you take a break, sometimes for hours while they set up the lights so that there's no shadows and it takes them forever to do it. That's just the nature of the beast. You shoot maybe an average of around seven pages a day. Whereas on motion capture, you shoot about 30 pages a day. You have to come in ready to rock and roll. You have to like know your material and be prepared. But then you don't have to wait for the camera to set up. Once they put the dots on your face, you don't have to wait for makeup or hair because it's all done with computers. And so you just go and go and like do a scene. And like I was saying, you know, you can you can collaborate. It's kind of like a being in a band where you're like, hey, let's try it like this now. And so you, you add that ele uh, extra element and you get a play. And it's really, it's more play. And so by far my favorite medium is now motion capture, performance capture. You also did some voice acting as well. We, we have yes. last year we had John Kaplan here, the famous- Oh my gosh, yes. yes. Final yeah. Fantasy. Classic it was, it was kind of crazy for me to figure out that his voice in the game is not actually him, it's you. Right. <laughs> so I met the body and the voice. And the voice. Is so far, which is yeah. great. Um, how can I imagine casting for, for, for a voiceover job? I'm sorry, how can you imagine? Casting for a voiceover job? Well, uh, so basically what happens is I get something over the email from my agent saying, a little breakdown of the character and then the lines and I'm in my little studio under the stairs where I just uh, give like a few different versions of, of ways that I think the audition you know, uh, should go and I submit that um, you know, in, in MP3 and then if they like my work then usually they'll call me in and we have like for instance for Final Fantasy um, they, they call me in and then we start playing with it and try different qualities, submit that, and then to the team at Square Enix in Japan, and then they make the selection of who they like. And that was how that happened. So how many voices can you do? Uh, it's, I change it up every time. I've never counted or anything. What I, I base it according to the specifications that I get, and what seems right for the character, you know? If, if, 
as someone who's a bit more controlled. And perhaps I might change it into an accent like this, maybe uh, a quality of voice, or if someone who's a bit more, you know, like loser or something like that, then I call on my, my Colorado roots um, uh, growing up there and kind of remember how people sound there and, and certain types and, and then base it on that. So it, it's almost an infinite, infinite variety on whatever seems right for the character. So just imagine, we do have Charles Martin in tears against Yes! The famous voice of Mark. Mark. Yeah. Just imagine, he's sick to it, he cannot talk. Could you do his voice? Uh, no, he goes up way up. I, I, I specialize more in the in the lower range uh, characters, so... Yeah, I, I you know, it's somebody like, I, I can't you really do... do. I can say the words, but yeah, I can do it. In Italian, I can do it, but it's not a problem. But as far as... Ah, so yeah, the, the, I, I'm not an impressionist, so um, there's some people that, you know, uh, are really very good at that. I'm not, not so good at the impressions, I just kind of try and come up with a unique voice for that character. Did you also do like, I don't know, like recordings just for your voice for like, telling stories or something like that instead of using it in movies or games? No, no. I mean, uh, when my kid was younger, I would read stories to her, you know, at bedtime and do all the voices and stuff like that, but as far as professionally, no. So when you work on a, on a voiceover project, how can I imagine that? Is, is it just you in the studio or um, are there like different people doing the dialogues well, with each other? It varies. Usually it's just you in the studio and there's like a session director and then a sound engineer and you're going um, over the lines. Sometimes you don't get the lines until right then. So it's it's uh, very immediate. They have like a computer screen with the lines printed up and you see the one and you do what they call an AB or an ABC. You do like two or three takes. Um, you'll say it once like, Break down the door! Break down the door! And you do it like two different ways, and like, okay, they, either they're happy with it, and they move on, or they're not. Sometimes it's very, very fast, but it's kind of like, if you're a musician, it's like sight reading. Um, and so you have to be able to deliver uh, on the spot, and that's, usually you're alone, and you pretend like you're with other people, so that's where the imagination and the acting part comes. Every once in a while you're lucky, where, like sometimes a World of Warcraft, they'll bring in a group of people, like if we're all orcs or something like that, and you get the chance to work with some legends in the business, and um, it is so much fun because then you can really interact, and, and it's, then it's like acting again, and you can have little moments uh, that, that are more improvised uh, rather than just what's on the, on the page, and that's always more fun. So and since there are no cameras doing a voiceover job, everyone comes in in the morning in their pajamas, unshaved and stuff. Is yeah, that how it is? Usually it's very casual. Yeah, that's uh, part of why I like it, because, you know, I, I don't have to dress up, I can just be very chill. And, um, yeah, you know, basically, uh, I mean, my, my leisure wear or my pajamas, yeah. So I can imagine when you do a voiceover job, it's pretty um, tough to have, like, an accurate speed of how you talk. How does that work? Do you have lines on paper, or can I imagine like a, like a karaoke show where you have the... Uh... Oh, oh, I see. Um, usually you don't have to worry about uh, the timing, but every once in a while, like for Final Fantasy, you, you do, because uh, the, the video is already shot, so you would see like John Campbell's face uh, doing the, the King Regis's motion, um, and, but you would hear the Japanese actors doing the voice, and you have to uh, hit the, the exact timing of those, um, uh, of the, the words that the, the Japanese actors would say, and, or sometimes even just the sound, which is very different culturally, you know, they, you know, it's like all of a sudden you have to stretch out the word and try and make it sound natural, even when it's not, and so it's, it's a very, technical challenge was actually really light. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is like literally a tenth of a second over. It's like, all right, let me let me do it again. And, and then you just like, all right, cut it off. And sometimes it's a big thing you have to say, but just get it very exact within the time allowed. And so that's a whole challenge unto itself that actually I like. But yeah, every once in a while you have to, most of the time I don't know. 
So you had your experiences with Young Dead in Days Gone. Yes. Uh, how would you uh, tell the people to prepare against Young Dead? We know I, we had this question yesterday, and I'm quite sure you couldn't sleep because you wanted to have the right answer for today. So how would you prepare yourself uh, in terms of the upcoming apocalypse? I, I think get some good friends, uh, have, have a tribe of people that you can count on and that you can divide up um, uh, the different skills. Because uh, uh, in real life, I feel like I do have friends like that, um, who, you know, some are very good with weapons, others uh, are good at organizing and, um, you know, having a, a plan on where to go when, when the, you know, the, the shit hits the fan. Um, and just, uh, uh, I don't know, it's, in a way, it's like, it's, it's weird, it's fun to imagine, like, what, would I, what would I do in a zombie apocalypse? And, you know, and, and um, then on the other hand, it's like, wait, okay, that's not, obviously it's not gonna happen, but it's just, you know, I don't know, it's, it's fun to go there, and like, I'm a big fan of Walking Dead, um, and so you, you see shows like that, it's like, oh yeah, I'd, hopefully I'd be more like that guy, you know, uh, be more Rick Grimes or Daryl, um, than, you know, uh, someone who doesn't succeed well in that world. Are you a person that believes in the undead and the zombie things, or is it just fictional? Uh, yeah. uh, you walk down Hollywood Boulevard sometimes, you'll see some undead, but um, uh, uh, in, in real life, no. You're, uh, you're representing an amazing skull tattoo in these days. Yes! Have you, what is the, the, the coolest cosplay you've seen so far from that game, going to any of the conventions? Um, the coolest one that I've seen, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be the obvious answer for me, but it's actually true. I, I've seen a lot of boozers, and uh, some, actually the, the people up at um, uh, Ben Studio up in Oregon, the developers of the game, a lot of them dressed as boozer with like full on the holster and uh, the skull cap, everything. It was really, really cool to see. Um, and so those. Actually, it meant a lot to me that these guys liked the characters so much that they dressed up as a loser, and so that was by far the coolest one I've seen. Do you, would you say you feel attached to that character? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, in fact, for Halloween, I'm thinking there's a good chance I might dress up as a loser uh, for Halloween. Um, well. You would shake your head for I'm Halloween. thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Last, last Halloween, I shaved like the size of my head because I wanted to be uh, in uh, Cable and Deadpool too. So like, I'm, I'm not afraid to go there. Uh, but I, the, the fun part would be if I could get a reproduction of that tattoo. Uh, shoot, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, but there's just the, the, there's one artist in particular who's responsible for all the tattoo work in Days Gone, both for Deke, uh, for Boozer, and even for Sarah. Like, it, it, she did amazing work. It's so good, and like I, I see that when when sometimes you'll see an image they'll show you when you're working on a project. Oh, this is what your character looks like, and then it evolves. Because Boozer didn't have that he had hair at the beginning when we started, and then like about a year into it, they said, "Okay, here's the the final on Boozer." And it's like oh, all of a sudden, like certain things come into play, and, and it makes sense, and it really helps inform your character. So how much of yourself is in that character? Um, quite, a, quite, a, quite a bit. The part of me that uh, is loyal and um, will, will do whatever it takes to support a good friend. Um, and you know, I hope I've never been put in a situation uh, where, where like when, when Boozer sees uh, the Rivers was treating the dog, and he just like has to go after them. I I haven't been in that position, but I hope I would act like Boozer would uh, in that position because I, I like his his sense of justice and and um, not not willing to let something like that happen. And I also like Boozer's sense of humor. You know, even when he's like drugged out and amputated his arm, he's always doing bad like dad jokes about um, you know. And giving someone a hand or something like that, uh, playing chopsticks uh, on the piano. It's like, that is definitely me doing bad, bad jokes.
So when you take over a role like that, you usually um, have the opportunity to develop the character yourself in the way he looks or acts? Uh, uh, in the way he looks? No, that's all done from the developers that they have like literally a huge art department and computer graphics specialists that, that work on it and they do all the work. Um, I'm just uh, in that silly kind of a, a lycra spandex suit with little balls all over it and your helmet. Um, but what I do have some control in, uh, actually quite a bit, is how he moves. So you'll see like my gestures and a lot of my facial gestures as well. And so that, um, and it's not something I think about usually. Um, it's just something I, that happens and it's like, yeah, I can see the character go, oh, yep, that's me, that's, I do that. Um, but as far as the look, uh, that's really up to the developers. And in terms of preparation, again, we, we had the bike situation before. You also shoot guns in the game and stuff yes. like that. Is that something you need to you need to do some research on yourself on how to hold a gun and how to aim a weapon? For absolutely, and every actor should know for that role what, what they did. I was lucky in that I grew up in Colorado, so I grew up hunting and fishing. So I know mean, even my character says something about like I learned this from my old man um, hunting, and that's exactly what I did growing up in Colorado, hunting deer and antelope. Um, so I knew, uh, I took like a hunter safety class when I was 15, you know, I was moving to America. Um, and it, it, so I, I had some knowledge. Uh, I've played other games where you have to have a more militaristic, where you really have to know, uh, have to know how to handle, uh, you know, either a sidearm or a you know, assault rifle or something like that. And that's where YouTube comes in, or sometimes they have um, uh, a technical, person who, who is really a specialist and will say make sure you hold it like this and your finger off the trigger etc and we'll give you some pointers to make it look realistic and a lot of times uh, there's a lot of guys that have gone through training uh, and really know their stuff so that's and that's the fun part of an actor is where you get to learn little different skills like that um, and, and that's part of the acting that I, I really enjoy is learning something different one, one thing that I had to learn um, we ended up not making it in the game, but there was one scene they wanted to do where uh, Boozer was going to take a hit from a bomb, and I don't, I don't do drugs, so I, I didn't know how to do that. My friend YouTube, I just look up on <laughs> how to take a hit from a bomb, and I, I had to go there and, and watch like, a few different ones, and then pretend on the day of the shooting it that they were doing like, oh, you take out the thing, and okay. So I, I, I did that, and afterwards, um, I had like the best compliment I've ever, ever had uh, for an acting job, where uh, one of the technical guys was like, oh, looks like someone knows what he's doing, and he's like, yes! <laughs> it's like, I had no idea what I was, what I was acting, and so I was very, very proud of that moment, even though it didn't make me. Uh, it seems like YouTube is like your little help. Hey, you know, it is. As I'm talking, I'm realizing, yeah, that's uh, every actor just uh, go to YouTube and you'll figure out how to do anything. What were the exact words you put in YouTube when you were researching the bomb? Um, I think it was like, you know, literally how to smoke from a bong and then all of a sudden, oh, uh, how to rip from a bong. It's like, oh, okay, start le learning the language. <laughs> and then so, you know, you just start start going and casually refining and, and as you learn and more researched in this, you know, uh, very deep and intense scholarly subject than, you know, you figure it out. It's like you go to your director and say, I, I have to shoot that scene, yeah. smoking a bomb, but in the meantime, I also know how to push rocks, and I know how to deal with them, and I'm a specialist. <laughs> That's a specialist. I'm a rock pushing specialist. <laughs> uh, you also played a character in Red Dead Redemption too. Yes. Um, did, did you uh, have to learn how to ride a, a horse? Um, no, um, because my character doesn't ride a horse in that one, actually. I, which, you know, I, when I found out it was Red Dead, I was like, oh my god, I hope so. But I'll tell you something interesting about that. My audition for that was completely in Italian. It was like a three-minute monologue in Italian. Um, no English whatsoever. And it, it was kind of like a, a union organizer organizing a bunch of men. And then when I show up on the set to give the actual script, it turns out it was all in Italian. I'm sorry, all in English, uh, but it was a, with an Italian accent. And I thought it was very strange that they they had me do it in Italian. When I talked to the director, 
uh, he said that they just wanted to make sure that someone would be authentic. Um, and so, they, they, you know, I would throw in like an Italian word here or there, but uh, it, it was very different from what I auditioned with, which was very strange, very surprising. To me. So you could you could use all the uh, the famous Italian swear words. Yes. <laughs> 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 I'm going to be, not today, not, not today, today, not today, I will, I'll say Calvaro instead, yeah. <laughs> so how, how can I be, I, can I imagine you prepare yourself for a role like that, because it plays in a time where, where we have no knowledge of it. Right, well, and that's the cool thing about video games, is sometimes they take place in a fantasy world. You, you could be in something like the turn of the century, kind of New Orleans type city, or um, like my character was in the dead, or you could be on an ice planet in the far reaches of the galaxy, or in a zombie apocalypse riding motorcycles. So it really comes down to your imagination. And so I, I really think about what it would be like to be in that like day to day, having to fight to, just to survive and having what that would do to you. Um, and you know, it's, it's really, it's the same thing as like when you're a kid and you play army, um, or you know, you, you just use your imagination, except you just try and do it at uh, a, a little deeper level um, so that you can bring it to life when, when the time comes. And also you think, where in my life am I similar to this character? You know, uh, like, Boozer's good at tracking and, well, Boozer's good at, at tracking and, and hunting. I was okay. I was not a great tracker, but I knew just a, a, a little enough to, to be able to pretend like I knew more. So we all know the situation, because you talk about imagination, we all know the situation where you read a book, you imagine how this world looks like, how the characters look like. So I, I can imagine you being in a role shooting for a computer game in an empty room with all yes. these thoughts. You try to imagine how the world around you looks like. Did you ever have that feeling seeing the end product where you're like, that's not how the world looks? Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a there was one in particular uh, where uh, Lost Planet Three, um, where I was envisioning it was it was an ice planet, and I was envisioning we were in these big heavy parkas with fur and stuff. And instead, when I saw the final product, it was this very skin tight uh, uh, suit that it, you know you move very differently when it's like this very tight uh, looking thing as opposed to big bulky winter parkas. And it's like, oh man, I wish they would have shown me that because it, something like that does affect how you move. And, and it was, uh, it, you know, just to think, ah, as an actor, you wish you would have known that and it would have informed your, your performance just a little bit. Although, I don't know, you know, honestly, uh, the regular gamer wouldn't probably pay, you know, pay attention to something like that. So the next question I really need to be uh, careful how I ask it to you. Okay. How does it feel uh, for you when you played with yourself for the first time <laughs> in the game? Um, it was awesome. Well, I, I kind of eased into it because the, the point of view of, of for, for example, for Days Gone is really from D. So I was like my best friend. So um, I, I have this thing where when I, when I watch a movie, I kind of go into just an audience mode, even if I've done something in it, whether it's TV or whatnot. Um, and so I did the same thing with the game. It was very easy for me, um, for the most part, to do that. Although every once in a while, the, the critic in me um, would be, would see my performance, it's like, ah, I didn't do that, or, you know, something like, uh, uh, you kind of either critique or judge, or it's like, oh, that, that came out well, I like that. I was, I'm glad that that came out that way because when you, you shoot it, you don't really know how it's going to turn out. So it was a mix of playing the game, being in the story, and then being out of it and judging my character or my acting at the same time. And how does it feel to know that other people are playing with you? <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. The, the, I think of my job as a storyteller. And I, I love that. Um, and so, when, like, for instance, when I play the game, I liked it so much. I, I don't play all my games. In fact, out of all the games I've played uh, that I've been in, Days Gone is the only one that I've completed. Um, and I liked it so much, I did it twice. Um, that, that's the truth. Um, and being able to, to tell a story to, 
that I, I don't know for me I got wrapped up in um, was wonderful and I, I got lost in this world and, and um, where you can experience the joy of, of protecting someone or um, struggling through something and, and achieving a, a harder goal or even just the joy of the open road like on a motorcycle there's times where you know, the, the sky is clear and all of a sudden you're riding a long distance and it just kind of slows down and the music comes on and you, you get the experience of being on, on an open road and like here I am playing a video game it feels like I'm riding a motorcycle in the Pacific Northwest in a beautiful area and it, it like it lifts your spirits and when I had that I got chills um, and so it, it, it it's so awesome to be a part of something that that helps people, it helped me to feel that way and hopefully it, it helps uh, the gamers feel that way, and so that's that's just an awesome feeling to be a part of something like that. It's great. You also had your experience in a lot of CSI episodes. <laughs> yes, uh, I did, did the trifecta. Ever, did you ever have a situation in your real life where you could use your CSI skills? <laughs> um, usually in, in CSI, I was always like the bad guy. So as far as my skills in CSI, I was always like killing people. I want to so so far, I've been happy to say I haven't had to use my skills uh, of killing people that I that I used in CSI in real life. But in this case, you're a specialist in how to know to avoid to get busted. I'm sorry, how to what? To, how to avoid to get busted? Yeah, you? <laughs> that's true. Well, I, I haven't had to use uh, uh, any of that yet. Yeah. So, or if I did, I'm not admitting it. You never know what's coming. They cry, right, right. <laughs> so you are uh, you're playing an interactive character in the games. Um, you're here also meeting people. What's the most favorite part in interacting with people? How do you usually interact with your fans? Um, well, uh, there's always online uh, at, at Jim underscore Perry, either on Twitter or on Instagram. But the, my favorite thing is here, like at the at the convention. Um, just come up and say hi to me, even if you're not getting an autograph or a photo, just come and say hi, because I always like to hear, uh, you know, I, I have had such a big body of work, sometimes it might be from a game, a specific thing, or a specific TV show, Friends, or, you know, CSI, or, or Lois and Clark, or whatever, and so I'm, I'm happy just to, to talk, and, uh, you know, it's always nice to kind of hear um, what people's take is, and, and I love it, so please come by and, and say hi. Yeah, that's, you should all do that because, as you can see, Jim is a very nice guy. <laughs> Thank like you very much. He is the same guy as they did. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because otherwise I was going to really tear you yeah, down when I get back there. Then I, then I wouldn't use my times. <laughs> How do you usually um, experience the, the fans coming to you? Is it like you have a bigger fan base coming from the gaming scene or from the movies? Or well, at, at the convention, I would say definitely it's more. Gaming. Well, it is funny, and um, just recently, uh, uh, in 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 the states, there's this certain age group. I, for a while, I was on the show that um, was called Victorious, or there was another one, um, uh, uh, Shake It Up, which were targeted towards kind of like what they call tweens, you know, the ten to thirteen year old kind of uh, age group, and. I can tell, like, I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll walk into a place, it started happening more recently, where the, the, the workers there look, look at me and they kind of do a double take and they go, were you, were you on TV or something? And, and, and they're like, they can't quite picture where it's from. And, then, and I'll say, Victorious, like, oh my God, yes. And I played the dad on Victorious or something. And so like the kids that were that age when I recorded it have now come of age. It's not starting to be more of them. And it seems to be, if they're, now, kind of like in, in that age group, I'm like, oh, they must have known me from that project. So but it's funny how it, it varies depending on where I am and also the age of the person. So this this is actually your last panel tonight. That's today. Yes. For this convention. Um, what's left on your plan for the rest of the day? For the rest of the day, um, I'll be doing autographs and photos uh, just over uh, over here. Please come by and, and see me and, and say hi. Um, and then after that, um, I'm going to do some, some sightseeing, um, probably take the tram uh, in Zurich today, uh, maybe for this evening if possible, and then do some more sightseeing locally and hopefully go to Lugano uh, perhaps the following day before heading home. So 
and you're gonna turn into a full-time tourist. Yeah, 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 exactly. Going, going from uh, enjoying uh, the wonderful uh, Zurich Game Show to being a full-time tourist in Switzerland. I hope you're gonna enjoy that. We actually, oh, I know I will. We actually enjoyed it having you here in Zurich oh, the Game Show. Thank Jim, you. Jim, thank you very much for being here. It's my pleasure. Give it a round of applause for Jim. Pierre.